Welcome to another episode of Behind the Now. Today I get to chat with award-winning author and public speaker, Bob Berg. With total book sales approaching 2 million copies, Bob is best known for his books, Endless Referrals, and The Go-Giver, which was a Wall Street Journal and Business Week bestseller and has sold over a million copies. Bob is also a top public speaker, leading audiences in the thousands and sharing platforms with today's top thought leaders, Olympic athletes, broadcast personalities, and others. Listen in to learn more about Bob's origins in radio and broadcasting and his top-notch advice for all creatives and business professionals to level up. Thank you so much for doing this, Bob. I really appreciate it. So you are a best-selling author. You're a keynote speaker. You've helped hundreds of companies level up to the next level. And I just want to first ask you, how did you get to where you are today? Like, what's your background? How did you know you wanted to go into this, into writing books? How did, how did all of this start? Uh, well, I began based, uh, actually as a broadcaster, first in radio, and then uh, for radio as a sportscaster, then television as a newscaster, because I couldn't get a job as a sportscaster. There were no mm-hmm. openings. Uh, and uh, But it turned out I really wasn't very good at, at news. Uh, I could read the news. I mean, anybody right. can read read the news, but I certainly wasn't a journalist and it wasn't long before I realized that was not going to be my, my career path. Mm -hmm. So I, I like to say I graduated into sales Mm -hmm. and the challenge for me was I had had no formal sales training. So I floundered for the first few months. Uh, Fortunately, while I was in a bookstore one day, I came across a couple of books on sales, which surprised me because I didn't even realize such a thing existed. This is a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, you know, sales books are ubiquitous. They were everywhere. Back then, you, you know, you just didn't hear about that kind of thing as much. But it kind of gave me hope that, wow, there's actually a methodology, a, a way to do this. I had no idea, you know. I, and uh, so I got the books and began studying and really studying them. I mean, every night to the wee hours of the morning, I would just read and rehearse and highlight and underline. And mm-hmm. I mean, just And really within a few weeks, my sales began to go really well. Now this was encouraging because it said, well, you know, if you, if you have a methodology, if you have a system, Mm -hmm. you can pretty much accomplish anything within reason. And I, if I personally define a system as simply the process of predictably achieving a goal Mm -hmm. based on a logical and specific set of how to principles, the key being predictability. Mm. So if it's been proven that by doing A, you can get the desired results of B, you know that all you need to do is A and continue Mm -hmm. to do A and continue to do A, and eventually you'll get the desired results of B. So that was a big thing for me. As part of selling, I also got into personal development because you quickly Mm. learn that, you know, the selling part is just one part of it, but it's the personal development. It's the books you read and the, well, back then it was tapes, right? That you Mm. listen to. You may not even know that that even existed. Okay. But in my day, it was tapes and cassette tapes. And, uh, uh, we hadn't even heard of you know DVDs or anything like that mm-hmm. back then, but I but still the information was the same and yeah and, and uh, I just gobbled it. it up and and started growing on the inside and really I think success really happens on the inside it manifests on the outside but it begins in here in, in mm-hmm. here in the brain and in here the heart and the gut and that, you know, and, uh, you know, eventually I worked my way up in another company to sales manager and was doing a lot of sales teaching and other companies started to ask me to work with them. And, um, what's the, uh, what was the, the thing on Seinfeld where they go, yada, 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 <laughs> 40 years later, whatever, here I am talking with you. So yes, really that's, that's just how it happened. Once I got into to speaking, you know, writing books was sort mm-hmm. of a natural you know, to do. Yeah. So early on, what were you selling? Like where, what were you selling exactly? What were you reading those books for? Well, I was selling, I was actually selling radio and and television advertising. Okay. Yeah. So I went from, from in front of the camera to nowhere near the camera, which is probably good with Mm -hmm. my face. You know, it's probably good to not be in front of the camera. So, uh, but I, (laughs) so yeah, it definitely went from there to sell. Then I sold other things, uh, you know, along the line, but until I, I finally began selling for myself, Mm-hmm. Uh, which I've now been doing for, I think, 30 years. I've been in business in the speaking yeah, writing. That's business. amazing. So one thing about your book, so you wrote the Go-Giver series, you co-wrote it. And mm-hmm. one thing about 
it that's very I found it very unique right away is that it's really a story. It's almost like, yes, there's all this wisdom and knowledge about sales, but you're following this protagonist and it feels yeah. like you're on his journey. And it's just, I think that makes that, it makes all of that information just very accessible to everyone because people love stories, right? And we can Jenna, relate to Joe. I, I think you're right on the mark. I mean, yes. <laughs> stories connect. Yeah, exactly. Heart, right. Right. And, and, and I know with me, because see, I had written the first book called Endless Referrals, which okay, was a book yeah. for entrepreneurs and salespeople on who they knew they had a great product or service. They knew they had great value to offer, but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable going out into their communities and developing and creating those relationships with people that would cause people to want to, to buy from them and mm -hmm. or refer them to others. So endless referrals was a step-by-step -step system for doing that. But throughout the years, I'd read other parables and had always enjoyed them because whenever I read them, I felt a connection with the author. Even if I didn't know the author, I felt right. a connection with them, um, a connection with the message, uh, a connection with the characters, right? Even though they were fictional. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought, wouldn't it be great if we could take the basic message of endless referrals, which is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know, like, and trust and put that into parable form. And that's where, you know, we sort of came up with the idea for the go-giver. I reached out to John David Mann, who at the mm -hmm. time was the editor in chief of a magazine I used to write for. And although he was not nearly as well known uh, then as he is now, within his niche, he was very well known as being a brilliant writer. And, uh, and, and he was such a great editor and, and the two aren't always the same, but in his case, it was, he was both a great editor and writer. Um, and so I asked him if he would be the lead writer and storyteller mm -hmm. and uh, if we could collaborate on it. And fortunately he said, yes, and you know, <laughs> we put it together. But it, you know, it only took us really a few months to write the story. Uh, the difficult part was getting, it was finding a publisher. Our agent went through 25 New York publishers who all said no in the course of a year before we, or 24, before the 25th one said yes. Yes, that's amazing. So what does that speak about like, perseverance how do you know when i how do you personally know when an idea is worth pursuing because it takes a lot of time and energy and i know you can't predict how something is going to turn out of course but what is it for you internally that you decide this is something i need to pursue you know i that's a wonderful question on a couple of levels because the fact is we don't always know if mm -hmm. the market is going to be ready for something at the time, if there's going to be a market, if it's something we're just in love with, but that doesn't necessarily mean there's a market for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think it comes down to if you really truly believe in what you're bringing to the table, your product, your service, your book, whatever it happens mm -hmm. to be, you just believe in it so much that you can't bear the idea of ever giving up on that dream, then you keep doing it. Yes. Because even if nothing ever happens, because we can never control the results. Right. And maybe it won't ever happen. Okay. But you can't control that. And if right, your dream exactly. is so big, and if your desire and your belief is so big, just do it for yourself. Do it because you just believe in it so mm -hmm. much. Okay. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, and then if it's supposed to happen, it's gonna. Right. And that's, that's very much about following your passion, like following your joy without without worrying so much about like the external result of it, which is very yeah. much your concept of giving it's giving without the, like it starts with, without I have an action. Yeah. 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 Without the I attachment. Mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's, is that how your path has been personally? Do you find that? Yeah. I mean, I've struggled with it at times though. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the, in my earlier days, I very much thought I, I had to be general manager of the universe. Mm -hmm. And, and so I was very attached to the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, so that was something I had to learn, uh, right. that, you know, Berg, you're not that good. You, you can't control it. <laughs> yeah. There's only one thing you can control your activity yes, and you can control exactly. how you relate to others. You can create relationships. You can do all those things that you can do. You cannot control the results. Yes, and that's it's really only as I began to learn that and embrace it and accept it that things got easier. Mm. So is there any specific challenge you can point, you can reflect on or like any specific challenges that you had to get through? And is it, yeah, is it mostly that mental, always that mental thing that comes and goes and you have to 
I think it's always the, the mental part is always an issue. It's always the issue. Right. You know, right. When you think of it because skills can be learned. Skill right. sets can be learned. We can, you know, and, and, and often what we enjoy, we tend to have a natural, you know, inclination an inclination for, for. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, so I think a lot of it is those feelings of worthiness, you know, the feelings that, that am I good enough to do this? Is, do I deserve <laughs> to have that? And, yeah. you know, I think mo- the only people I think who don't ever struggle with that are narcissists. They mm-hmm. really, you know, they probably don't. And I don't know this for sure, but I suspect they don't, mm-hmm. they don't know any better. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the rest of us, I, I think the rest of us, uh, and we know when it comes right down to it, a narcissist really doesn't have a lot of self-confidence. It's all kind of a sham that mm-hmm. they played on themselves. But I think most of us, sure, we have these doubts. And, you know, we have to we have to constantly question those doubts and, and ask, why do we have them? You know, what do they benefit us? And, well, no, mm-hmm. probably not. And and, you know, do those things prepare, learn and, and uh, you know, work within that. Yeah. Do you have specific little things that you like? Do you meditate? Do you, if there's anything that you specifically do to overcome that when it comes up or not really like, or is it different all the time? I don't, I don't meditate myself, uh, Uh though. I know so many people who do and they swear by it and they absolutely, you know, love it. Uh, With me, I think what I do is I will kind of delve into a, a book. Uh, You know what I'm saying? That I'm like a a book like Michael Singer's um, um, untethered Other soul, soul. Yeah, yeah. yeah, or his surrender experiment, you <laughs> right. know, which is the second book. You know, I can pick up those books and read those at any time and find a passage that helps me. Yes, deal. that's amazing. That's that such idea. good advice for anyone because sometimes people find it difficult or they don't feel like truly, for instance, like meditating, but anything like sitting down and having to control it themselves. But reading a book like that, you're not having to control it. You're just, you're passively reading it, you know, and you let it speak to you. So that's what we all have. You know, we all have different ways. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way or an either or it can be an end. Um, But, you know, that's what works for me. Yeah, I love that. So this podcast is often geared towards creatives like actors, directors, producers, Mm -hmm. And there's so many amazing resources. And like your book is amazing about oh, um, about these things, about business, but it really applies to all of life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but how would you, this is a bit difficult, but like, how would you necessarily, so like say for an actor, for instance, they're like always auditioning and auditioning mm-hmm. and like, that's it. How would you kind of apply? What would you say to that person in terms of looking at themselves as a business to thrive as that, to not be so dependent all the time on like other people choosing you? Like right. when that's the industry in many ways, if that makes sense. Sure. Can you speak oh, it, about it, that? It, it's a it hard makes, one. It, no, it makes total okay. sense. <laughs> um, the first is, you know, you get the best at your craft that you possibly can. Yes. Okay. But that's like anything. That's a product, right? You right. always want to have the best product or the best service. Well, as an actor, um, you are your product. You Mm -hmm, are your service. Okay. So, you know, you take the courses, you study, you learn, you do everything you, you can to get good at what you do, but that's just the baseline Mm -hmm. because there's a lot of great acting professionals out there. Just like there's a lot of great products, services, and everything else, but that's the baseline. We have to Mm -hmm. be good at what we do when we're really good at what we do. That gives us confidence. Okay. Uh, you know, it's the person who goes in and and learns their lines so well that they don't have to think about the lines while they're doing it because of it. They're not focused on themselves. They can focus on the people they're auditioning for. Mm -hmm. Not that I know your business. So I'll probably say things wrong in terms of. No, it's okay. Say anything. Uh, Okay. So then it's this, it's creating relationships with people. Okay. So that you've got people on your side Mm. and you've got people who will refer you for an audition or for a right. job or, or that's or true for, for any okay? industry yeah, absolutely. The people it's okay. people everything is exactly when you go to an audition okay you do the very best you can but this is where you and i were talking about okay not being attached to the result right and i would suggest any acting professional to read michael singer's books you know i'd read the surrender experiment yes. and i'd read I've the read um untethered, untethered soul. soul yeah and there's other books on, of that genre that are very good. Those yes, just happen to be two yeah. of my favorites by, by Mr. Singer. Uh, because 
you know, to the degree that you're not. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want it. That doesn't mean you don't desire. Yeah. It means you prefer to get the part. OK, but you're not emotionally attached to it. Right. So your sense of happiness and peace of mind is not dependent on somebody else's decision. Mm -hmm. Now, the neat thing is that's not only good for ourselves, but um, in terms of how we feel, it actually makes us more attractive mm. to those we're auditioning for, yes, right? Definitely. Because mm -hmm. they see that confidence. They see that, you know, I, I call it, I, and I didn't coin this term, I heard it from someone else, when you care, but not that much. <laughs> yeah. And when that's the case, you go in there a lot more powerful. You know what uh -huh. I'm saying? It's so, very true that, yes. Now, yeah. I would also... You know, I'm a big believer in, in writing handwritten notes of thanks. Mm. I would send a handwritten note of thanks. You know, I, I have mine on my my personalized note card. Mm. Um, but um, I would write a handwritten note of thanks after the interview to the and, and this is where, you know, you would know I don't to the whoever it would be, the casting right, director like cast or the, whatever, whoever mm -hmm. it would be. And and to the you know, a person who is um, at the front desk who ushers you, I'd make sure I would just get in the habit of writing thank you notes to everybody, yeah. just thanking them for their time and their courtesy. It was a pleasure to, you know, to blah, 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 you know, uh -huh. what have you. Just start doing that and start really building that network of people who know, like, and trust you because you're right. doing those little extra things that that other people don't even think of doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's, that's really any industry because yeah. everything comes down to people Absolutely, and everything. That's like when Jennifer was on here, she brought up your book and she said, everything is sales, really like everything <laughs> is people and you all, and you write about, it's not about the product. It's not about the sales, um, you, it's about nothing but the other person, right? Yeah, about the other person. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's true Value for you're adding to that other person. I always say, you know, be inwardly motivated, but yeah. outwardly focused. Mm, yes. I love that. And then the other part of it all is to not have any attachment to the external result, right? which is right. sometimes hard. Oh you know, no. It, one it's, second. It's okay. hard a lot. Right. That is one of the most difficult things to really get. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, and it was only when I got that, that things started to like really turn for me. Mm. I'm telling you, it is, it, it's something we have to constantly work on until right. we get it. And even then you still have to, because yeah, there's still times it comes like, up, it creeps in. Right? Of course, absolutely. We're human beings. Yeah. So that's going to happen. But, you know, again, we go back to that saying care, but not that much. And right. when you can remember that, that kind of, that's my sort of cue to help me remember to not be attached. You know, when I feel yeah. myself getting a little bit attached to an outcome, I say, okay, Berg, you can care, but not that much. Right. And like, <laughs> sometimes I've heard also to like set it and forget it. So it's ah, like, okay, I said, that's it. That's I what it. I want. Okay. Like, like the old commercial, if you remember that said it, well, you're telling me you're probably much too young <laughs> for that, but there was a Ron Papil used to have this. He, he, he was one of the big infomercial kings mm -hmm. back in the day. And his thing was, he had this product where you set it and forget it. That's, that's right. <laughs> well, there you go. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Wow. So, so much. I love that. Yeah. Cause so much is really universal, but it's like hearing it through a different story and hearing it. And you say this too. A lot of it is simple. You'll say like, how could something so simple be so profound <laughs> or like uh, have such an impact? And it is often, it's just yeah, really, sure. yes. It's just like really applying it which is the thing, you know? Ah, uh, that, that is. That is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, typically we know what to do. Yeah. That will apply it. Right. right <laughs> exactly. Action. And consistently because. Yes. Oh, yeah. That, the consistency. That's, that's the difference maker too. Yeah, definitely. So what is your process when you're writing? What's your writing process like when you're sitting down to write a book or co-write a book? Um, do you start with like outlines? This is like the nitty gritty, but what is your process like? So it depends on the type of book. Okay. So all of my books before, uh, aside from the Go-Giver books, the series of four okay. books that I wrote with John, okay? All my books before that and after that have been how-to books. I'm a how-to mm. writer. I'm step one, step two, step okay. three. I'm kind of okay. boring in other words, okay? <laughs> that's, that's what it is there, how-to books. Okay. And, and so I start with the title, which should be oh. short and pithy, okay? Uh, 
then a longer, more descriptive subtitle. Okay, so let's take my first book, Endless Referrals. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, why did I name it that? Because it was a book on sales. It was for people who wanted to, to make more sales. Mm -hmm. What do all salespeople understand is the best way to have more sales happen? Referrals. Mm -hmm. What's even better than referrals? Endless referrals. So I put <laughs> right. the benefit right in the title. Endless right. referrals. Now, how do you get there? Well, now the more descriptive subtitle, network your everyday contacts into sales. Now, mm -hmm. this was back in the day before there were thousands of networking books out there. So when I wrote that back in the 90s, I was one of probably three or four or five people who had books wow. on networking. So the term wasn't as overused as it is mm -hmm. these days and as misunderstood as it, it, well, it's always been kind of misunderstood, but right now even more so but but so it was a it was an attractive subtitle network your everyday contacts into sales so you mm. the title the subtitle now i'd start with that but that doesn't mean that will be your final title and subtitle mm -hmm. okay but start with it so you know where you are right you it gives you like that are. specificity the focus of it, the uh, exactly. like a thesis sentence and an essay yeah Right. Okay. Yeah, it, exactly. Perfect. Now, the next thing I would do is I would write the introduction. Why? It's interesting that so often you think of the introduction as that part of the book you skip over. <laughs> but I remember reading a book called How to Read a Book. <laughs> uh, that was the name of the book, How to <laughs> wow, Read a Book by okay. Mortimer Adler. A wonderful book. And mm -hmm. one of the things he said, which made a, such a difference for me, he said, if you when you read an introduction, Within that introduction, the author will always tell you the purpose of his or her book, why they wrote it, what they want mm. you to get from it. And so I've always read introductions and I've always seen it. It's always there somewhere yeah. within that introduction. So here's why I say write your introduction first, because your introduction will clarify your message for you. Mm -hmm. Even if they never read it, even if the, the, the reader never reads it, right. write your introduction for you. Because, you know, John often quotes uh, Joan Didion, a famous author who wrote, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, she wrote, I, I write to discover what I think. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. yeah. yeah. And so a lot of times when we write that introduction, we'll actually clarify for ourselves what we want right. the reader to get out of it. And remember, our book is not about us. It's about the reader, mm -hmm. okay? So I'd say go the introduction. Now, what I would do after the introduction is write your table of contents, which is what? The chapter titles, okay? So you really go in order so far. It I do, like. but that yeah. works for me. That's not mm -hmm. necessarily how it might for someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just how I, how I would do it. Um, so then with the chapter titles, and again, you want to make them short and pithy, okay? Mm -hmm. But then what I would do is I'd write all the chapter titles. Again, these, they can all change later. That's not that you don't have to worry about getting it right the first time. In fact, you won't the first on the first right. go around. At least I never have, okay? And most people haven't. Now, then I'd write the first paragraph of each chapter. Why? Because that paragraph is sort of the introduction of the chapter. Right, right. And what you want them to get from it. So mm -hmm. now you've got all that. Now go in and fill in the blanks. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You know, so, so that's yeah. now, that's for writing a, a, a how-to book. Now for mm -hmm. writing a parable, what you do is you find somebody like John David Mann, who's a great storyteller. Because uh -huh. <laughs> really writing a parable is something that I, I wouldn't have done that alone. That was mm -hmm. outside my strength zone. I'm a how-to author. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't really, I'm not really you qualified. You guys were a great like, team because you had these different strengths. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. And, and here's the thing though, you know, John, wrote a uh, uh, an ebook it's a free ebook called how to write good or at least gooder He's got yeah. a good sense of humor. but so you can get that if you go to john david man with two ends.com and then on mm -hmm. the upper right hand side there's a little thing that says get his free ebook yes i get know his ebook and read yeah. that's a great book for uh for any writer mm -hmm. to read because i mean this guy knows how to not only how to tell a story he knows how to teach how to tell a story. Mm, that's amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. That's really amazing. So you have a very logical way of um, going about it, it seems. Yes. Yes. I okay. see it. That works for me, that logical way, um, because I need that kind of structure. Yes. Yes. Or, it's, or the book's never going to get done. Yeah. I love writing and I've always loved English. And like in school writing essays, 
I'm a kind of the exact opposite of you though. Like I would write, I'd have, at least in the beginning, I would have to yeah. write and Just like write figure out what it up. is. Yes. Yeah. And then kind of right. um, realize what was there. Right. And then you like yeah. cut out, wait, this isn't it. That's funny though. <laughs> that's good, but that's a good way to do it too. Yeah. Because it, you know what the best way to do it is? The way that works for you, for you and the way that yeah. you're going to actually do it. Yeah. And that was when I was younger though. Like over time, I got much better at, seeing the structure before mm-hmm. so then you mm-hmm. don't have to waste all that time but i remember uh, early uh, on that's my natural thing first you know yeah uh, yeah and then i also wrote a screenplay and i found myself back into exactly what i had to do when i was like younger and it was like uh, oh my goodness and it was like so hard to to like really figure out like any holes in things you know so yeah. yeah, they like all came up again for like oh, another really cool. medium. Yeah. So that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still figuring that out. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to ask you just a few fun questions. Okay. Okay. I will, I will do my best to give you fun answers. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> what is, what is your favorite animal? Uh, dogs, though I love all animals, and I've really grown to love cats since ah, uh, because um, the uh, you know I I live in a condo community and it's difficult to to have a, a dog uh-huh. and really be able to. Plus, for years I was traveling all the time, and I didn't feel it was fair to to, yeah. the dog to do that. So I had a cat. I had a couple cats. One I had a um, stray cat that I adopted, wow. and then I had another cat that I adopted from the the um, shelter, you know, that I, that I do work with. And, and so those were over the courses of years. And I mean, I just fell in love with them and came to a whole new appreciation of cats. And now, uh, since Calvin, the little, the little one, uh, passed last year, oh, who I still miss, um, now I get to, uh, foster kittens for a, um, for another rescue that, they um i'm one of their network of of fosters before adopting a cat so i usually have two or three kittens at a time and they are a riot and they're adorable and they are a joy to have so i would still say you know i'm a dog person i grew up with dogs and that they there seems to be a kind of a real connection with with dogs but i i love cats too but i love all animals yes i'm the same i don't animals. think we should experiment them i don't think yeah. we should do anything that's that that mistreats them yeah and uh so yeah and i and i feel strongly about that yes me too actually that's cool um what is something that sounds like good advice but is actually bad advice oh okay and we kind of talked about this a little bit okay, that's earlier good. so and this is this is really cool that you brought it up and it's not that it's bad advice, it's just incomplete advice. Mm. And that is when people say, follow your passion and the money will come, mm-hmm. okay? It's not bad advice, it's just incomplete, okay? Right. You need to, sure, follow your passion. Why would we, we live a whole life? Why would we wanna do something we're not passionate about? Follow your passion, but you've also gotta make sure that, that there's a market for it. Mm. And you've got to be able to sell and you've got to be able to engage with your market and people have to buy this thing that you're passionate about mm-hmm. uh, if you want it to be a business. Right. Now, if you want it to be a hobby, that's not important, but uh, <laughs> right. you know what I'm saying? So you know, right. your, pa- your, your passion is acting, great. You've still got to know how to market yourself, right. sell yourself, create these relationships. You've got to get really good at what you do, right? You want mm-hmm. to be a producer? Fine. You've got to know how to produce, but you've all and, and feel great about it. But you've also got to network and you've got to co- create relationships. You've got to get right. And so, right. so I, I, so the follow the passion and the money will come. I think it just misses one part. It does. Yeah. That's a great <laughs> answer because yeah, I mean, I could talk so much about that, but definitely that's an amazing answer. Thank okay. You. And then this podcast is called behind the now but there's always an emphasis on be the now. And we kind of touched on this. So it's up to you if you want to add to it or not. I just like to end it with this. <laughs> um, but in what ways do you be the now? So you said already you'll often, um, you have like these go-to books you'll read. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else? Like even little- And of course, things? Eckhart Tolle's yeah. book was great. If you read oh. that, The Power of Now. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, God, I have that, that one. Wonderful book. Um, so here's the thing about this. You know, how do you stay in the now, right? I think what you do is you practice being conscious, Mm. okay? Because it is so easy as a human being to just 
you know, it's like driving from your house to somewhere you've been a hundred times right. and you've done that. And probably you've gotten to where you are. You don't even remember how you got there. Mm -hmm. You just broke. You don't know. Right. You couldn't go through all the thoughts you had. You could, and there's good reason for that, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, but imagine though, taking that ride and being in the now the entire time, watching everything and taking it all in and observing and, and, watching yourself observing yourself mm. being present and observing okay all these things are great very difficult yeah okay? and and i think it's a matter of just practice 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 staying conscious and then catch yourself not having been conscious mm -hmm. you know don't get yeah. mad at yourself but just ah got it it's uh, an know, awareness just, right and it's an awareness and i think it's just practicing Yes. And you can get to the point where it becomes more and more natural. Yes, I agree with all of that. That's so amazing. And it's no matter what you're doing, what time of day, it always is applying that. That always applies. Wow. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. You are amazing. And I was so uh, excited to have you on here. And you gave such like you're amazing so thank you so much I really thank you it. you say the kindest things that's very, <laughs> very nice of you to say it. and it's been my honor and pleasure to be with you 